Uh, so next, I'm really excited to introduce Ruth Oliver. Ruth was a postdoc with our group for several years and now a faculty at UC Santa Barbara. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's so nice to be back, and uh, thank you so much for patiently waiting till Friday to hear my talk. When Scott asked me to present in the session, I knew it would be a really tough challenge to follow all these really incredible talks and conversations, so I intentionally kept my title quite vague to try and react to what everyone was doing, so bear with me. Um, you may also find this familiar. How am I supposed to do? Oh, there we go. Um, if you're not familiar with cards and checks and things that go, I felt that coming into this meeting, we would probably be asked to think very creatively. Um, and that made me think of what I contend is one of the most creative texts on animal movement. Uh, if you're not familiar with the world of Richard Scarry, I'm so happy to be your introduction. This may also be one of the longer texts. I think it's about 70 pages. Um, but I can't really imagine a world more creative than a cat driving a shark car and chickens being mowed down by a wolf market. Anyway. Um, <laughs> I think that we've all stayed very creative in this meeting so far, and I've been really impressed by the different perspectives that we've brought to movement data, and I really appreciated how from the beginning we really thought about movement data as just one star in this larger constellation of biodiversity data types. And so I was going to talk about a few ways that I'm thinking about bringing movement data into a larger picture of biodiversity science. So the first one I wanted to talk about was born out of this uh, initiative that Scott and Diego kindly presented on already, so you may be sick of hearing about so far. Um, but as I mentioned, this COVID-19 initiative was really a major mobilizing activity for our community. So pandemic, like in many, many aspects of our lives, really exposed places where we were unprepared. Um, you know, we, this, to answer the questions of how animals were responding to changes in human activity, we really had to mobilize to rapidly try and synthesize data that was already being collected. And even though, you know, like Sarah presented on, we've seen similar efforts over the past, we really found ourselves in trouble and challenged to really try and bring together data sets from different people quickly and synthesize that into understanding very rapidly. And so I think, unfortunately, we can all imagine that going into the future, this, this is the type of situation that's going to come up more and more often. And so I think part of the initiative that's been really interesting to me is thinking about how we're going to do that in the, in the wake of really rapid change and trying to, like some of the tools Scott was talking about, being able to bring together really disparate data sets and synthesize information very quickly. But despite all the challenges that we saw on the animal movement side, we found different but substantial challenges in adding humans into the picture. So Scott kindly alluded to the data that we're leveraging in this empirical work that we're doing in the United States for birds and mammals. Um, and our estimates of human activity are coming from uh, aggregated data from SafeGraph, which is device counts from mobile devices being carried by people around in their daily lives. Um, it was a real challenge to get access to this type of data, and the reason that we were able to do so were because of the very lax privacy laws in the United States. So this is concerning to us on two fronts. One, that the U.S. Ex is exceptional <laughs> in this front. <laughs> And two, that we, we really don't have um, readily accessible standardized data sets that are more spatially representative of what's going on around the world. And so this got us thinking about, well, you know, if we're trying to understand how humans are impacting wildlife and we don't have a good picture of what humans are doing, we're really missing some big key, key pieces of the picture. And so as an activity of the initiative, Diego, right, um, I'm really happy to co-lead this effort with, uh, we started a major activity under this initiative to really rethink how we're quantifying the human footprint. And so we've been doing so by engaging the community to really reimagine this. And so we've been engaging with marine scientists and many human geographers um, to try and rethink how we quantify the human footprint in a more flexible, dynamic way. So I just wanted to present a little bit about our first output from this, which is a new conceptual framework that we're about to submit this. So we started to, to think about how we would come up with a dynamic human footprint. We started conceptualizing what the key classes of anthropogenic drivers are across the marine and terrestrial realm. So humans, their vehicles, infrastructure, and then the byproducts of those two that really sit in this interface of infrastructure and mobility. And then from that, we sort of listed out what the key observables of each of those drivers would be. So things like population density, transit activity, land cover, use, light and sound pollution. 
And then we wanted to link these to different ecological scales that may be of interest to different research questions. And then try and expose what gaps we might have in our ability to quantify drivers. So there's a lot to unpack here, but we surveyed available products for each of these variables and have connected them to the ecological scales of interest based on their spatiotemporal resolution. So what I'm showing here on the left is just an example of um, a few data sets within each of those uh, driver types. But what I want to point out is that in this bottom left corner, which we think is most relevant to behavioral uh, responses, which would be the most appropriate to link to movement data, actually all of these data sets, none of them are publicly available. So most of them are held by private tech companies that you don't have access to. So this raises a huge red flag for us. So we envision really what would we want in an ideal situation, and we're envisioning this in a quite bold way. So we're thinking about this not as a singular product, but as a framework that can support multidimensional dynamic products that would be dynamic in three key aspects. The first being flexible aggregation. You know, I think in our conversations yesterday, we heard a lot about different use cases are going to need different, uh, would want different uh, drivers incorporated. So recreational, commercial might have un different underlying drivers present. Um, obviously flexible spatiotemporal resolution, you know, relevant to both the resolution of your data sets, but also the extent. So, you know, you may be working on a local scale where you can tap into local products that are only available there, whereas if you're doing global scale studies, you need globally continuous information. And then also time varying, right? Like, as we all know, humans are changing all the time, and we need these produced in a more uh, synchronous to what the types of responses that we're looking for. So we envision this as a framework for achieving the dynamic information on human activities. There's a lot in here, but what we envision is a, is a process that would take a wide diversity of inputs that we might have from different drivers and integrate them into our desired products through um, a, a number of, of steps. <laughs> but this is really where the magic happens and the meat of where things get difficult. But we, we highlighted a lot of key gaps and, and areas that we think are really important places to put effort. Um, so first and foremost, research collaborations. It's been fantastic to work with human geographers and think about how they're thinking about linking movements of different types, right? So animals and humans. Um, data support and transparency. So like I mentioned before, a lot of the higher resolution products on human mobility are being held by private tech companies. And even when they are releasing some aggregate products, there's very limited transparency in how those were generated, and there's almost no information on long-term support. So I think it's going to be really important to partner with those organizations to try and figure out ways that we can bridge, you know, without getting the raw underlying data, but maintain support into the future. Um, obviously, many, many geo-privacy and quality control issues to go into this, and so again, this has to be really at the forefront. As with any interdisciplinary study, we're really advocating for unified terminology and standardization. So we're advocating to think about this in an analysis way to remote sensing, where we have layers of different classes uh, ready for readiness. And um, key to this is engaging social scientists to make sure that we're understanding the socio-cultural context of the, of the data that we're looking at. And uh, the real engine of this all is going to be a new development of data fusion and interpolation approaches. We're, we're not going to have high resolution information on human mobility at a global scale. And so there's going to be many cases where we need to make uh, best estimates of how to fill in those gaps. So going back to our constellation, um, we might think of this dynamic human footprint as just a set of tools that we can bring in to complement our biodiversity sensing. Um, but now I'm going to talk briefly about some ways that we might start thinking about bringing these things on the outside together. So bringing in different biodiversity data. So while I was at Yale working with Walter, we were interested in tracking progress on how current biodiversity data stores are filling biodiversity information gaps. So we developed metrics to assess how well spatiotemporal biodiversity data records cover species expected range, so what proportion of the range is receiving data, um, and then assess that against the huge ma the massive data stores available in GBIT for terrestrial vertebrates. And so what we see is that since 1950, we have an explosion of data. So this is on a pure annual basis, the number of records being collected um, by taxa on the left, um, and particularly for birds, it's just astounding how much data we're, we're collecting. Um, but when we scan all the way over to the right and look at data coverage, we see that on average, even bird species are receiving only less than 20% of their ranges being covered per year, and that's less than 5% when we look at other terrestrial vertebrates, which we would contend are probably some of the best sample taxa. 
so this is learning, and I think to me it makes, it makes us think create. We need to think creatively about how to fill in these information gaps moving forward. So I just wanted to highlight one partnership that is really exciting to me. Um, I'm involved in the Wildlife Insights Initiative, which is a, a large collaboration of um, so many organizations to develop a platform where camera trap users can upload their images, receive species level identification supported by Google, and then also receive back fabulous analytics that were developed by Fabiola, who's in the room, and I'm sure would be happy to answer any questions. Um, but also to, to encourage people to share across cities so that we can get this much broader picture of what's going on. Um, so Fabiola and I have been working on you know, using this framework that I talked about for assessing biodiversity data coverage. Uh, Wildlife Insights was launched last summer, and folks are starting to put their data in there. It's still a relatively small data set, but already growing very quickly. And so we were interested in asking, so how do these different biodiversity data types complement one another? And we were able to look at, if you added in the camera tracking data from Wildlife Insights to what we have from GFIT, what boosts in data coverage might you see? Um, and so here I'm highlighting the places on the left, the countries, and then the uh, species on the right, where we see the largest boost in data coverage. And this is exciting to me because a lot of the countries that we see with the largest boost tend to be in tropical latitudes, many in South America. These are places that typically have very low biodiversity data coverage and aren't represented well in many of the larger scale, like GBIT, they're not well represented. On the right, what's exciting to me is that, you know, obviously it's more relevant for mammals than birds because of the detection capabilities of camera traps, but um, these aren't necessarily large body charismatic species. Many of these are small body rodents that are, I often don't receive a lot of attention and, and again, don't make it into these large scale um, data aggregators. So, yeah, this is exciting to me to think about, you know, this is just the first pass at thinking about the relative information content of these different data sets. This is just coverage, but we can start begin to think about different ways that different sensor types can talk about one another. So I wanted to make a pitch that, you know, as someone who's been involved in audio data, camera trap data, and movement data, all these communities typically organize around their technologies of interest and are really struggling to solve these issues, sort of often in isolation. But I think a lot of us are, are dealing with similar challenges. Even the audio and camera trap communities are able to talk, which is fascinating to me. Um, and I think, you know, we're, we're trying to solve similar challenges, and so it would be really interesting to start trying to break down those barriers and think about a more synthetic way to try and bring them back together. Um, like I mentioned before, you know, I've just been thinking about this in terms of data coverage, but we could start to think about the different uh, ecological inputs and the, the different ways that these state types. So, like, some really simple things to think about would be, like, uh, data types that are spatially structured versus not spatially structured, the different levels that these different data sets that so the radar is operating um, above the species level, giving us community-wide bi biome assessments of bird populations. And so just a pitch to you know, start bringing these together and thinking about them in unison. So with that, 